he met his wife there. So it just shows what you can do in 15 minutes if you're determined. Uh, so, uh, so now they only allow the monks to visit for 10 minutes after mass. <laughs> so that's the number of 15 minutes. So don't lose anyone else. So, but he was so, so, uh, uh, so he went, he ended up getting married, but uh, he was, he changed so much. Um, and you know, it's with my brother, so I really, you could tell, and I was just was amazed how much calmer he got about life. It was just transforming to him. So when I when they asked me novice mass so as a young priest, and they and I said I need to get ready. Do you mind if I do a sabbatical? Because Chuck was saying you should go there, even though he had left already. He said you should go there. So I spent six months at the monastery. And Thomas Keating was very generous with his time meeting with me every week, and it was really this is material that he developed that I'd like to share with you. But I took it and I started to use it in the novitiate. Um, and um, um, I would say that it has changed the, the whole, um, the way we interact with one another. Um, it, it, when I joined the Alves, of course it was, you know, it was 70, I joined in 74, I'm 65 now. Um, it, you know, it was the Vietnam War and everybody's against authority and the long hair and all of that stuff was going on. And so it was a rough time, there's no question. Vatican II had happened 10 years earlier, and so guys were fighting about whether we should change or shouldn't change. Everybody was going through it. A lot of guys are quitting, um, getting married or just quitting. So it was a tough time, and we were fighting. And I remembered, I, I was a little naive. I joined uh, the order, and I was kind of shocked to see the fighting in an oddly community among priests, yelling at each other. Some guys hadn't talked to each other for 10, 20 years. So one of the things I thought about through formation was, was you know, how, how, I, how bad that was, you know, and how it's not a way that we should be living. So when I got to this material from Father Keating and then I got into the novitiate, I always not just taught it, because it only takes 30, 40 minutes to, to go through, but I stayed with it, because the, the, our egos have an amazing way of going, that's nice material, uh, now let me keep going on the programs that I love and that I've lived by. So yes, I see it all, it's very clear, but, and so the novitiate really became calling guys to task, saying, you are upset, why are you really upset? And that's really what the talk is, why do we really get upset? Well, seeing our upset and understanding where it comes from has, has really paid off. And, and not that guys all agree. I mean, we're a bunch of men. We obviously don't agree how to run a school. Complete, you know, there's not total agreement on that or what apostles to take, whatever we're doing. But boy, it's so kind now. It's so much better. We will sit around, if we're upset, we'll start usually with, you know, I'm upset. I know it's my stuff. I know you set it off, uh, but I, I can see it's not you, it's me. But it would help me if you wouldn't do that anymore because I'm not quite where I should be be able to tolerate that. Now that approach is so much different from what I saw when I joined the order. You screwball, you are ticking me off. You know, that confrontational, just, it's your fault, I have nothing to do with it, I'm not involved in this, it, you know, you can, I'm sorry, pick it on you, you'll never sit in the front again. Um, you know, so, so, you know, but you can see why, you can see the difference there. So let's get through the material. Uh, it's a pretty easy model. It's the only reason I like it. Um, I've used it in marriage encounter and, and, and all kinds of places. It's pretty handy. Okay. It's based on two books. It's mostly this book. You can get, it's a small book, easy to read. If you ever want to order that on Amazon, uh, The Human Condition by Thomas Keating. It pretty much covers what I'm going to cover tonight. So you'd have it in written form from the author. This book, Invitation to Love, is about centering prayer, but the beginning parts of it are very good, too in terms of theory and spirituality. So here's what Thomas Keating comes up with in The Human Condition. First of all, we start off with the story of Adam and Eve, and we, we know from the story of Adam and Eve that God created us for unlimited happiness, the enjoyment of all truth and love without end. That's what we had in the garden. That's what we're made for. We're not really supposed to be that upset in life. Now, life is very upsetting, and we do get very upset. Uh, things happen, but we know that originally this was how we were designed and made for those things. And the insight, the spiritual insight of the story of Adam and Eve is that something went wrong. And as the story goes, by eating from the tree of life, self-consciousness, humanity experienced itself as separate from God. In other words, we're cast out of the garden 
uh, were uh, of Eden. In the garden, we were immediately, uh, God was immediately accessible to us. And so all security, all love was available all the time. We were with the source of the God that was all powerful and almighty. So there was, there was no fear of anything, disease and sickness and all of that. We were happy. Once we got out of the garden, we're looking around going, oh my goodness, I'm going to get sick. I could die. Uh, I need to control the things around me. Uh, I need to get affection. I need to get people that like me and esteem me, which is tied in control and security and all the. So there's like these three basic needs that we all experience outside of the Garden of Eden that humanity experiences, which are these, right? Security and safety, affection and esteem, and power and control. We all need that. So these are good things. I'm not saying these are bad things. We all need those three things. And we know what happens if kids are born and they don't have safety or they don't have affection, esteem, or they don't have any control. We know that really messes up kids. They've got to have some of that. Okay. So that's where we are outside the garden. This is some people have pointed out that this sounds a bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs which I think they still teach today. And uh, uh, you can see it is. There's a little bit of, uh, from a psychological point of view, uh, that is true. Although I think Keating gleaned most of his from the Desert Fathers. Now, there's a little story he is, maybe you've heard this one, this guy is looking for his keys uh, underneath this street light. And he's definitely intoxicated. <laughs> and he just can't find his uh, keys. So a policewoman comes along and she kind of feels a little sorry for him. She says, sir, what, what are you doing? He says, I can't find my keys. She decides to try to help him find the keys. Other people walk by and they see the situation and what's up, he can't find his keys. Pretty soon there's 10, 20 people looking for these keys. Finally, the policewoman says to the guy, do you know where you lost them? Oh yeah, I lost them in the bar over there. Then why are we looking here? Pointing to the street light, he said, because the light is much better here. The light is much better here. Now I'm going to come back to that story, but that pretty much describes the human condition. Okay? Let's see from there. Okay. There are three consequences to the original sin, according to Aquinas. And here's what they are. Maybe you've seen these before. First of all, we don't know where to find happiness, which is called, he calls ignorance. St. Augustine calls ignorance. We look for it in the wrong places, which he calls concupiscence. And even when we find it, we don't have the strength to get there, which is weakness of will. It's kind of a dark picture of humanity. Some people just go, that's too dark for me or pessimistic, but it is in the tradition. St. Uh, uh, Saint Augustine. Ignorance, concupiscence, and weakness of will are the three effects of original sin. So the human condition, according to St. Augustine, could be defined as to be without the true source of happiness like we had in the Garden of Eden. God is the true source of happiness. To be without it, it's the presence and love of God, of course. We lost the keys and we, uh, to happiness is what we've lost. And so you could further say the chief characteristic of the human condition is that everybody's looking for the keys to happiness in the wrong place. Okay? So it can't possibly be found. It's the guy under the, why are we looking there? Everybody else is, or the street light is better. But it's not where it's really found, the human condition. This oblate from years ago that's yelling at another oblate, my happiness is getting you to say you're sorry and stop doing it, admit, I'm gonna get happiness how? I'm gonna control everyone in my life. I'm gonna do it by being a bastard. I'm just gonna get mad at everyone. And they're gonna be afraid of me, and then I'll be happy. That's how successful that is. Not. So we're all looking. Someone else, right? I'm gonna get everyone to like me. That's how I'll be happy. Hate it when someone doesn't like me. Then they don't respect me. It pisses me off. So I'm gonna get everybody to like me. And then I'll be happy. Everyone's looking for the, the happiness in the wrong places. As you get older, right? All of the cosmetics and stuff, everything from Viagra to you know, plastic surgery and all that. Why? So that I don't get old. I don't get old. I'm afraid of death. Does it make people happy? 
pretty limited. So people are looking, spending money, and looking for love in the wrong places, happiness in the wrong places. Okay? So that's the basic uh, situation, the human condition that we're all in. I would say the three places we most look, and I'm going to give you some examples, I'm going to have to leave you guys to give you some examples from your own lives. Uh, security, affection, and power. This is where we look, because this is what we really need. And the problem isn't that we, obviously, like I said, these are good, and we all need some of this in our lives. But it's that old principle that if a little is good, then more must be better, right? There's the, that's, that's a great human statement. Huh? If a little is good, more must be better. And so as kids, we develop these little programs around the basic needs. And the basic needs really become exaggerated needs. That's what happens. The basic needs become exaggerated needs. Because if a little is good, more must be better. It's in the exaggerated needs that we find our, our upset and our unhappiness. And so here's, here's a statement right out of Keating's book. Since the experience of the presence of God is not available at the age we start to develop self-consciousness, the three basic biological needs are all we have to find happiness. And so as little kids, we create little programs for happiness around these biological needs. Like for me to be happy, I have to be controlled the people around me. Or for me to be happy, I have to get everybody to like me. Now I'm going to be asking you which one, maybe one of these is greater in your life than another. Maybe you're more um, around affection, esteem is your issue, more of your issue, your exaggerated need. Or maybe it's power and control, maybe it's security. Okay. I'll go through each one of these, and then when I'm done, I'd like to get kind of a, a, some discussion going. Okay, we, we, we'll have a little bit of time. As you can see, it's not a complicated uh, model at all. Um, so, let's take a look at these one at a time. First of all, security and safety. When it gets exaggerated, what does it look like? Well, demands for survival and security turns into excessive wealth, workaholism, uh, worried about fitness and health, uh, hypochondriacs fall in this, fear of death and illness. For me to be happy, I've got to have security symbols. Um, the example I usually give is this one from, I have so many really, but this is years ago. So I was working with the deaf in the Archdiocese of Detroit. That was my job at the time, my first six years as a priest. So a, a couple come in, they have a deaf kid in their family, but they have four kids. One is deaf, so it's always a challenge. And a little bit more work, and their you know, mom's trying to learn sign language. Dad wasn't too good at the sign language. Well, dad's working, two jobs. So, so almost 16 hours a day. And so they come in to see me, and it's pretty classic stuff. You know, they're, you know, she says, I'm, I'm getting near a divorce. I can't take this anymore. He's never home. He's no support, you know, that sort of thing. Well, what's up? He works all the time. He's never home. Why do you work all the time? We need the money. No, we don't need the money, she says. Yes, we do. We got four kids. There's going to be colleges. It could be a rainy day. Things could go bad. We, I need to be saving money. We need to be saving money. She says... No, I would rather be poor and have you at home helping with the kids so they know their father than you always go. So that's that's where it went. Now what was going on is we were going on, it was very obvious that he had strong survival needs. She did not. She had strong affection needs. Okay. And that was a challenge. And so, you know, we talked a bit about money. I wasn't getting anywhere. Because there was no amount of money. What What is it? A million that finally you go, we've made it. We've got enough. Two million? Three million? You know, really, where is that number? It's pretty, you know, it's really a mindset. People just keep going, well, we could really use another 100,000. So, you know, when I finally got them, they're two together today, as far as I know. But but what, what, I, what I did was I basically said, divorce is so expensive. That's the direction I went. You're going to lose your whole security nest egg. Patrimony and all this and the kids. And, and he started thinking about that. He goes, oh, that's so expensive. And he decided to cut back on the hours. See how that goes? So that was his thing. Now, other people, I had a novice. And I said, he goes, I'm security. I go, you're joining a religious order. You're taking a vow of poverty. Like, what's that about? Well, the, the order's 
pretty well off. You own a camp, we own a camp, we own a couple high schools, you know. So he's going, we got retirement fund. I go, okay, okay. He goes, but that's not what I think about. I go, what do you think about? Think about leadership. Leadership. He goes, I'm worried that leadership's going to fail us and then the order's going to collapse and I'll be in trouble. I think a lot about leadership. I go, really? I never think about leadership. It doesn't even cross my mind. That's what he does. Can you see how that would work with security? You know, who's in charge? So that's a classic exaggerated need for security. I'll do all three. I want to find out where, if you have any that you feel you're a little bigger on than others. Now here's, oh, I saw these on the internet. I, dear God, little kids thinking about this stuff already. Instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just eat the ones you got now? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thinking about that. Getting <laughs> right. Uh, Dear God, if you give me genie's lamp like Aladdin, I'll give you anything you want, except my money and my chess set. <laughs> so, so the money and chess set is a security symbol for this poor kid that can't live without it. I had a toy, movie projector. I, I, would, I, was, I, I kept thinking, what would I say if we had a fire? And it wasn't my brother. It was that, it was that projector. <laughs> I love that projector. So, anyway, okay. So that's, that's the first one. Now here's the second one, affection and esteem. So what does this look like if it's exaggerated in our lives? Well, it's the demands for pleasure, affection, and esteem. So hedonism, recognition, status, a high degree, multiple PhDs, and so forth. Okay, that's what this can look like. And this is the one I most identify with. So you may say I identify with all three or none of them, I don't know. But I, this is the one that I, that I identify with. And the story I usually tell is back uh, when I was teaching, I taught 10 years at Madonna University. So they had 100 deaf students there. So I gave some, I gave a class, I would sign it, and then another section I would speak it. So I had this class going on. And uh, you know, after a few years, you kind of feel, you know, you get good feedback and people generally gave me good reviews. And so I don't know why I was so insecure, but I'm insecure. And so after one of the classes, this one student, she held back, it was a morality class, which is always, you know, the tough, the ones that stirs up stuff in people more than St. Paul does. <laughs> and so um, she held back and, you know, 30 students leaving the classroom. Nice job, Father, good lecture, thank you, whatever. You know, they took off. So this, she held back and she came up, she said, Father, I totally disagree with that point you made and I'm sorry I've taken this class. I'm gonna try to get out of it, but I don't think I can get my money back and I'm just so angry. So I, you know, what did I say? What did you hear me say? So I get real kind of like, oh my goodness, this is awful. I've never had a student say this. And so, anyways, I don't think she really heard my point, but I couldn't convince her, whatever. So I, eventually I leave, and I have a 30 minute drive back to the Deaf Center from the college, and guess what I'm thinking about for 30 minutes on the way back to the Deaf Center? The, the, you know, the five or six kids that said nice lecture? Not at all. All I could think about was her. Then I get home, and another hour, two hours, laying in bed, thinking about how I can fix this. Not how I can control her, I'm not, it wasn't really big power control. It was how I could fix it. Power control person is how can I get rid of her? <laughs> when I'm affection esteem, was how can I win her over? This is awful. Maybe I can meet with her all this. This is what was going through my mind, okay? So there's affection esteem. It's, it's, you know, it's not enough that, you know, decent number of people like me or whatever. It's that everyone, I need everybody to like me. And if they don't, then that's, that's the upset causing thing, okay? If they don't respect me. I, I was uh, provincial council meetings. Um, I was the young one back in the day. Um, and uh, they would, one of the other provincial councilors who was older kept calling me Kenny at the meeting. Well, Kenny, I don't think that's a really good idea. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, that's, you know, everyone calls me Ken, not Kenny. It's like, you know, when I was a little boy. So that used to just, I'd see, now why? Why am I getting this reaction? doesn't respect me. You know, I'd be driving home, I'm quitting them. Oh, that's like a five-year-old. I'm gonna quit that provincial council and then they'll be sorry and I'll really teach them a lesson because everyone will find out I quit. You know how you think like a little kid. Okay, so I don't know if that hits home with any of you. But that was, that was another example, so good one. Okay, the final one, oh, here's some kids. Already affection, esteem. Dear God, I bet it's very hard for you to love all and everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family and I can never <laughs> So she's thinking about affection and esteem. Okay, the last one is power and control, which is exaggerated demands 
to control situations and other people. So it can look like aggression, racism, sexism, codependency, manipulation, and so forth. The story I usually tell for this one is when I was a deacon, transitional deacon. I went out to Utah. This priest is dead. He doesn't mind me sharing this now. Um, but uh, he was power control. There's no, he was this power control pastor. Classic, stereotypical, he's in charge. And the nun that ran the school was another power control. So you can be sure they were really not friends. <laughs> and so they would fight him and, and argue about things. But we always had an all-school mass on Fridays and at 8.30. So they had some fight on Thursday, I guess. So I'm over there and at the rectory, which is like a house separate from the church. So we had to walk across the street to get there. And it's 8.25, Father hasn't moved yet. And I said, Father, Mass starts in five minutes. We gotta get over there. They can't start without me. See the power control, passive aggressive? They can't start without me. So at 8.30, when Mass is supposed to start, he finally gets up to walk over to the church. So being the affection steam guy, of course, I'm trying to make everything right. So I, sister's coming to me going, you got to get them, get moving. We got the kids are here. We got a schedule to keep. Yes, sister. I'll, and then I go in the sacristy. But they're ready to start, Father. Would you? I'm going to start without me, you know. And he's cleaning the candlesticks. He's just a, it's so passive aggressive. <laughs> so now sister's going to force him out of the sacristy by starting the opening song. So she signals the nun to start the opening song. They sang all five verses of the opening song until he finally came out after the song was over. So he wasn't going to be forced out by sister. So now there it is. You, you know, now, it, you know, these are adults. It sounds like kids. And this is, this is how this stuff goes. So that's an example of power control. So for me to be happy, I've got to be in charge. For me to be, maybe you know some of these people. They can be bosses. They sometimes rise to the top, uh, but they're not fun to work for. Good. So there they are. Now, how do you know which one? Oh, here's here's one of these good things. Maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had the right rooms. So all of you who are in the same house, if you control issues there, I don't know. So. Okay, why don't these programs for happiness that we make as little kids, we really they, we start them as little kids. For me to be happy, everyone's got to like me. And, and we just grow into adulthood and we kind of carry these programs with us. Why don't they work? Well, they don't work because people don't cooperate with us. They have their own programs for happiness. Why are they going to cooperate? And another reason is life doesn't cooperate. You know, next thing you know, you get sick, the stock market, you lose a million dollars on the stock market, you have to go to Tahiti to get over it. You know, so, so you know, that sort of thing. So life doesn't cooperate. At this point, I, oh yeah, I threw this in. I would probably get off track. But expectations, it also causes upset. Father Keating told me that I was leaving confession, and he said, remember, Ken, expectation causes upset. And I've used that in a lot of homilies. Because expectation is about control. You expected to start at 8, you expected this thing, you're going to expect it to, or 7, whatever it was, you expected to end by 8.15, you expect to be able to, whatever, get in through the door, when you get here, it's not locked. Our whole life is operated around expectations. And we need them. Okay? But expectations sometimes they don't get met and a lot of our upset comes from expectations, <coughs> expectations. I usually tell this little story I, don't, yeah, I guess I left it in here here's an expectation so I, I was provincial for eight years and uh, and this is the provincial of the other American province Jim Greenfield who's now uh, president of the South University but he was the provincial and I was in I was at our school in Toledo and I didn't expect the job to be so much senior care. You know, I'm supposed to be like, the, I'm the boss. But every senior problem, they come to me. So Father Kelly is like 85 years old, comes to me about eight o'clock at night, hit the Band-Aid on his bottom fell off in the shower. He got it wet and he can't get to it. He needs someone to put it on and there's no nurse. I'm like, really? So, you know, it's kind of, well, Ken, put on your, you know, big boy pants and go do this, you know. So here I am, and I have my phone, and I put my phone down, and I, you know, I'm bandaging this 85-year-old butt, putting this Band-Aid on, and the phone, I hear the phone, you know, some, a text came in. I could tell the text came in. 
and I put that bandaid on. And we get all done, and I'm washing my hands, and, and then I, I go and look at my phone, and it's this picture. The moment I was putting band-aids on his butt, the other provincial was shaking hands with the Pope. I said, this is, life is unfair. That's a, life, is, life, life is unfair. So expectations, huh? Expectations. Okay. Now, which one are you? Which one are you? One way to know is how you get upset. In this sense, upset is one of the greatest gifts that God gives us in life. We hate it. We don't like to be upset. Although sometimes upset is, we do like it because it gives us energy. <laughs> but generally speaking, upset's not a great way to get energy. But, but uh, a lot of people live off of that energy. But anyways, upset uh, can tell us. If we find that our biggest upset is worry, often that's a sign that we've got exaggerated needs of security and safety. And if you know people that are mostly worried all the time, you know, I'm worried about dying, I'm worried about getting sick, I'm worried about COVID, I'm worried about leaving the house, I'm whatever, it's security and safety, probably. And it may be, may be deserved, I mean, it may be normal, but it may be exaggerated. It's a bit of a judgment call. Sad, sadness often goes with affection esteem. I was sad when she didn't like my class and wanted out, right? So sadness is a pretty typical. And then power and control is anger. Anger, like this priest just would get mad at this nun all the time. Anger. Now, you can also be angry that you lost a security symbol, and you can be sad that you lost it, and you can be sad because you don't have it. So it's not 100%, but generally speaking, this, is, this pretty much works out. So that's how you can kind of tell the exaggerated. So the upset in our lives is a window into our true value system. And as spiritual people, I mean, here you guys are, committed Catholics come into something like this is wonderful it's beautiful and and we believe that Christ is our security and that God is our security and our and our affection and our power and control it's kind of interesting there's three of these right in there God is tr Trinity right so we have God the Father who is Almighty he's Lord he's in charge a lot of times things happen and you know I go Lord can I just accept this you allowed this to happen why can't I you know I didn't maybe you didn't even want this to happen maybe I know I didn't want this to happen but you allowed it to happen can I allow it God wills I will God permits I'll permit it's the hardest solution to discern anyways so power and control God is almighty he's in charge Jesus is our savior who saves us even from death and the Holy Spirit is, by definition, the love of the Father and the, and the Son who resides in our heart. So we have the very source of love through baptism. We have a Savior and we have an Almighty Father. So what, what the upset reveals really is, is our real value system. I can say God's my everything. I believe Jesus is my Savior. I know God's in control. Now, why'd you just do that? Well, what's that about? It shows me I'm not really believing this. See what I'm saying? And this is why saints become saints, is because they actually start to believe this. And, and you see in saints, they don't get that upset, except maybe a righteous upset about some awful thing that happens to somebody else. But for themselves, they'll put up with almost anything, including martyrdom. Um, or being belittled or put up with anything. They don't care because God is their security and their love and their power control. Does that, does that make sense? So, so that's, that's the value of, of the upsetting emotions. They really show us where we're at. Okay. Uh, I think we're at a point. I'd love to get some, some. Let me see where we're at here. Yeah. Let's go back to this one then. Oh, no, not that one. <laughs> okay, there we go. No. There it is. Okay, so here they are, the three centers. And um, I wanted to just get some, a, a, mo a moment. We, how are we doing on time? You all right? Uh, yeah, we're, we're good. Okay. As I was talking, um, did would any of you like to share where you think, is any of these more exaggerated in your life? Mine is affection, esteem, like I said. 
Uh, is any of these, do you identify any one of these more than the other? It's easier to do with other people, of course, but then it gets, gets a little gossipy. So, <laughs> yes? Um, I think mine is also a question that it seems. I know that I have, like, like I have a mental process where, like, I really care about the way people perceive me, but I try to present myself in a way that people don't notice that. Mm -hmm. People do not know that I do that, so. Very honest, yeah. That's me. <laughs> Others? Yes. Uh, it's also a question seems for me as well, similar to what you said, Anthony, but also just wanting to be receive recognition mm -hmm. like, um, in, you know, subtle ways, I think, more than anything, but, um, yeah, that was definitely glaring to me, so. Just out of curiosity, anyone power control in here, maybe in the back? Yes. <laughs> That's the one you, know, you know why I said in the back? Because affection steam people sit closer. And people who want control sit in the back, they can cut out if it's a bad talk. You, you have more control if you sit in the back. See what I'm saying? And you have in front you may get more of my attention. It's just it's just kind of subtle. But I've noticed that over the years giving the talk. I'm always watching. And when I speak at schools, the coaches sit in the back. <laughs> They're all control guys. <laughs> you know, but your good coach is a control guy. So okay, and so that one is that one's wrong for you. You get upset mostly around losing control or not, you know, control situation or a person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anger for sure. When I when I used to do pre cana I used use this model. It was amazing. I never ever had a couple who both identified as power and control. Those 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 relationships broke up before they got to pre -cana. It was almost always an affection esteem person. So I think there's more of these than the other two. But they either were connected with a power control or security, especially this combination. And it was kind of like, I'll let you be in charge as long as you love me. I'll love you as long as you let me take you know, <laughs> in charge you. So that was an interesting, you know, and, and if you're dating and you find that you're, you're the same, um, it, it can work. I'm not saying that, but this is the toughest one. <laughs> Both that'd be pretty redeeming. Be aware of what's going on. Uh, but sometimes this gets, uh, what was that movie with, uh, oh, it was years ago about Satan, uh, and, and it was Kevin, you know, Frazier, Frazier was the actor. That's an old movie, but the devil, he gets to try his life over at different times. And he tries, they make him into different people. <coughs> they made him into this super sappy, affection, esteem guy. <laughs> anyways, you didn't see the movie, so forget all. I'm sorry, Barbara. But anyways, <laughs> it's a good example of that. But does that make sense? You can kind of see that. Sometimes this gets to be a little, if you're around a couple that are both this, it can be a little much. You know, oh, you're so perfect. No, you're perfect, my dear. No, you're perfect. You know, uh, okay. I'm going out here. Um, yeah, anyone else on what you are? Yes. I think definitely it's lines of one and two, but okay. maybe a little bit more skewed towards two. Just like, I think maybe as a youngish kid, like always trying to, you know, gain people's respect or like fight for recognition and that kind of stuff. That's what I see it as too. Good. Others? Yes. I'd say definitely safety and security. I feel like I'm always, especially seeing the primary aspect being way I'm always worrying about everything I feel like I always have like I think the biggest thing for me is like I have a set view of how things like I would want them to go and then I worry that and that something doesn't go my way about like the consequences of right that. right and then what will happen and most of the time they go your way right so the worry is yeah most of the upset is unnecessary is what we find later but you know when we're going through it it's really real yes I'm, I'm still conflicted on whether it's security or affection, but I think, I get a bit of argue for both, like, I, I, I kind of, like, understood what you were saying about when, you, when somebody criticizes you want to, like, fix it, because when I ran into, like, an emotional problem with somebody, I, my first thought, like, the only thing I can think about throughout the rest of the day is, how can I fix this? How can I yeah. get back together with that person? Um, I don't want to be mad at me, like, I can't, and don't go mad at me. Um, so that's basically all I think about. Good, good. Yes. I think when I first heard this talk, I didn't relate to one and three at all. I was, and it was the point 
um, in my college career when I was trying to find really good clients, felt very lonely, uh, really needing a professional team. In some ways, it got away from that. But now, approaching graduation, one and three are, are standing out far more than two. So I'm worrying about, all right, what if I don't get this job? What, if, what am I gonna do after graduation? And then when things go wrong, I can get angry feeling like I'm out of control of certain things. Um, and even just ex expectations for the last semester of school and those things aren't met. I can feel upset and angry just knowing how far we've been behind. Good observation that what we're going through can, can really elicit some of this. Um, obviously, if the, I don't know, if the war started or we had a shutdown, all of us, this first one would perk up in us, you know, because there's a shooter, a live shooter here, you know, somewhere. Or you can imagine, you know, those kinds of things. And, and age, too, as you age. Now, I've noticed over the years, although I still identify as <coughs> self-esteem, still a big one, this one used to be nothing. I never, and then it's more now. And maybe that's because you lose control as you get older. Like I can't come up with words that I used to. I don't feel like, like I present myself as well as I used to. I'm losing control. And it's pretty minor, but it's gonna get worse. Both mom and dad died of dementia. So I'm looking at that going, when's that gonna kick in, will it? So, you st you know, so that's it. And also, cause I was in charge for eight years, you get, you, so jobs and what you get into. So now I'm in charge. And I'm being Mr. Nice Guy, it ain't working. And I've got to like, I've got to tap some of this. And then still they don't listen. And then you're, and then I find myself mad because I can't, you know, get what I want out of them to be disobedient. So that was, that was interesting to observe that. I had completely lost them, even though I'm not provincial anymore. It's interesting, like the new provincial do something, I'm like, I wouldn't have done it that way. Where's that, you know, there's a control thing, right? Why is he doing it that way? So it's interesting to watch the thing. Of course, the better response is, Lord, thank you. The province is in his hands, which is really in your hands. And, you know, I'll give some offer, some advice or whatever is asked or appropriate. But I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to control it. And it's not an affront on my, the job I did that it's going in a different direction. I don't have to take it personally. This is another way to say this is we take things personally. So, there, there they are. Okay. Um, St. Francis de Sales, as we looked at this, um, this is a, a chart from Keating, basically saying depending on our temperament will be how we re respond. So if we might withdraw, we might get aggressive, we might be dependent, depending on you know, um, our personality. So you can be, you can be power control and withdraw because you can't control it, or you can get aggressive, or you can become dependent. See what I mean? Or you can even be affection esteem and do the same thing. So this is kind of a way of, of looking at it, um, a chart that he has in his book, if you buy the book. Um, and then, um, yeah, this is the slide. I just, there's only two more slides left. This is St. Francis de Sales, so I may outlay the St. Francis de Sales, so I, I always quote him, you know, it's a security thing or job security. <laughs> so, uh, no man ever thought his anger unjustified. That's a great line, you know. And we always think our anger unjustified. Um, but it, as I looked at my life, I look at my life, I'd have to say that my anger is really pretty childish. The things I wish I could get angry about more angry about and do something about I don't and the stupid stuff in life is what ticks me off if you just look at anger I could also talk about sadness and I could talk about worry same thing but to talk about it. so for example you know human trafficking it's it's awful I can stand here and say it's awful but like it's upsetting but I've never lost sleep over it. I haven't given it that much thought it hasn't impacted me I don't know anybody that's done that ministry or you know so it I know it should generate a more of an outcry I should at least have written one letter by now to some congressman or something but nothing so far but if I go to the store and I'm in a rush running you know I get back and cook for a group and I'm obviously the next one and the woman behind me and they open up a new count a new lane checkout lane and she goes around and gets there first I'm talking about that for two hours when I get back 
you know, I am just, I'm there going, I can't believe she just did that. I'm in a rush. Almost everything I get upset about when I look back has been on that level. Maybe a little bit more, but it's generally just that stuff. You know, who didn't put gas in the car? Don't they know, you know, someone's going to use it after them? Um, you know, I don't know, a hundred things. Um, worry, same thing, you know, we're running Catholic Youth. Will we get everything done? Will it all come together? I'm not so worried about the environment. I should be more worried about that. I'm sure I should. But I'm more worried about what's about me. You know, well, I look like a fool this summer because camp has to be, parts of it have to be canceled because I didn't get it done. You know, and get it. That, it's always that level. So, I, you know, people will bring up that Jesus got mad at the temple. I hear that often when I give this talk. What, what got Jesus mad? It wasn't personal. A lot of scripture scholars say what they were doing there was ripping off the poor. And we know Jesus had a love for the poor. And it was always defending the poor. People, poor would bring their animals to be sacrificed. And then there's this little operation going on. And the priest would come by and say, there's a blemish on that sheep. You can't use that one. You have to buy this one, ours, which is jacked up in price. Oh, you've got the temple money to do that? Oh, guess what? It's, it's, it's Roman money. You've got to exchange it for our money. Oh, the exchange rate is 50%. See? So here in the name of God, using the law of God, they're ripping off the poor. And so Jesus, his, job, his anger is really justified. It's not about him. He could just get a fish to spit up two coins. He didn't have to worry about the temple tax. I guess he could even spit up Roman coins. I mean, uh, the Roman, I don't know, Jewish coins. Anyways, he got that covered. So, but but he, it was for somebody else. I, you know, I'm just aware how often my programs for happiness is all about various forms of me and my little life instead of the bigger stuff. Like Jesus was near to me. Um, when it comes to him, he's being nailed to a cross, and he doesn't even say, "You idiots, you got the wrong guy." Lord, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Now, there's somebody that did not have a false self, not an exaggerated need and need to be me. Your will be done. You know, because uh, so this is this is uh, how it works. When you get there, and and it's really hard. It takes a lifetime, and even after that, I still get hooked. I've been doing this for 40 years, 30 years, whatever it's been. I still get, but a lot less. I just say that so you don't give up. Keep. It really, life becomes more enjoyable, more happy when God becomes the source of our happiness and not, and not these temporary passing things that we think are going to make us happy. Good. I think that's it. I think that's it. That's the last slide. Yeah. Good. Any any questions or comments at the end? Yes. So you mentioned uh, in your talk how like we always see that like this is right, this is true. And we don't implement it. Like the weakness of will. Mm -hmm. I like for me right now, this is all amazing, but I have no idea what it means. It's that's an excellent point, because that's exactly right. That's his third point, is even when we know the right way. Um, there was a, a lady that was close to Keating that came up with this welcoming prayer. So I'll share that with you. This was her device, and I think it's pretty solid. It's close to the direction of tension in her heart. Um, which is which is when you get upset, she says, as soon as you recognize you're upset, take a moment to step back. That's the hardest part. And say to yourself, where, why am I upset? What expectation has upset me? Or what, what one of the three, security, affection, esteem. Is it exaggerated? You're almost always gonna get a yes on that. You know? And then, thank God for the upset is it different than repressing it or ignoring it? Why do we thank God for it? We just reveal a, an avenue for me to become holier. So now I have the opportunity to recognize in the upset where I'm not my true value system, which is not your value system. And then I say, you know, let go, let God. Whether it's control or you're my only love if it's affection, esteem, or you're my salvation if it's security. And, and we start to use those prayers and it starts to change. This is, I wasn't going to show because it gets a little involved, but since you asked the question, this is really is the very last slide. This is a little complicated, but in a minute more, since you have 
This is what Keating kind of came up with, uh, is kind of how this works. So here's the conscious and the unconscious mind. This stuff is tough to change because it's in the unconscious, and it's very hard to like, access it. Dreams, you know, you get an indication sometimes, but it's really hard. So the programs for happiness, for me to be happy, I've got to control everyone or whatever. That's in the unconscious. And so it comes up. We have attachments and we have aversions. We want, to, we want the attachments, we want to avoid the aversions. We all have it. You know, things we want to happen, things we don't want to happen. We, that creates hidden agendas. My hidden agenda tonight is what? My, my agenda was to give this talk. What's my hidden agenda as an affection esteemed person? That you guys like me. That's my hidden agenda. It's not too hidden anymore for me. <laughs> if you all walk out here and go, that was the worst talk, I'm sorry everybody do. It'll, it'll, it won't take me uh, three hours anymore, but I'll, I'll be working on that on the way home. <laughs> so, okay, so my hidden agenda, or my hidden agenda in those provincial council meetings, to be respectful. I'm there to give my advice, but I'm really there to be respectful. That's the hidden agenda. Okay, so that's the hidden agendas that come. Uh, you, you take a course, that's the agenda. What's the hidden agenda? To do very well in it, to create the avenues to get a great job, whatever. So those are the, okay. The triggering effect is gonna be something that frustrates that pattern. So now they don't respect me. You guys hate the talk, whatever it is. That's the trigger. Still can't do anything about it, to answer your question. This is the, this is the frustration we feel when it comes. That's the moment we can start to do something. As soon as we recognize the upset, the frustration, 5A is where we coup a core, it's a, a French word, to cut short. This is the only place we can really work on it. If we work on it, this will decrease over a lifetime. This doesn't get built up more and more. If we don't work on it, then the afflictive motions come in. I never get respected or I'm gonna get even with them. And now the tapes start running. Every offense, everything that's down here comes up and it builds. The internal dialogue gets going and the emotional turmoil, which all upsets us on the unconscious level. Maybe we have a bad dream about it that night. That's how much it affects us. And it reinforces the programs for happiness. I've gotta get even more power, more respect, more affection, depending on what it is. And now this is even bigger. And now the cycle continues. Now I come into the next thing in my life. And this is even stronger. And the hidden agendas are even more powerful. And then there's the upset. So this is the place. And if we can catch it there, this will gradually lessen unconsciously the programs. If we don't catch it, it will not. It will usually increase. We become more bastards than we were before. <laughs> Okay, so th that's a long answer, but since, yeah. Yes? I kind of feel like it's a yes and no answer, but are hidden agendas bad? Are hidden agendas bad? Yeah. That's a good question. I don't think they're usually immoral, from the bad in the sense of immoral. You know, I want all you guys to like my talk. Is that immoral? I don't know. I wouldn't say they're bad that way. They're not good for me because I'm setting myself up for upset. So it would be better if if, the, if you guys like to talk, it's kind of like icing on the cake, and I can go home and go, oh good, that went well, and I move on. Keating was one of the most, Father Keating was the most spiritually advanced person I've ever met. Ever. And I watched some woman in the bookstore when I was there for six months gush over him. You changed my life, your books meant so much. She went on for about 15 minutes. He gave her a big hug, he's a really loving guy. And I was just standing in the right spot. When she left, I could see that he moved on immediately from that. You know, I just, I don't know, his face just changed. It was like, he's not thinking about it anymore. And I was thinking, I would have held on to that compliment for at least a day. You know, so it's, it's, what do I, so it's not bad, but it's not, um, it's not helpful. Or at least if we can recognize the hidden agendas, then they're not so hidden, and then they don't have the power to trigger. Take another way to go. You're gonna have them. And again, there's a normal amount of affection, steam, power people that we need. So I, I don't wanna make that a bad guy. We need some of them. We just don't need it so it's heavy. The novice is what I go to, Mark. We just go. <laughs> I'm preaching. <laughs>
Okay, good? Hey, if you guys want to come out for Hermitage, um, let me just do this. So here are the Hermitages. I guess that's big enough, huh? The, the, our website is desales.org. I got that domain name back during dial up. I want that on my tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> All the Salishas of Don Bosco want that. I go, no, 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 the Oblates got it. <laughs> so, okay, so just click on Hermitage. And um, th these are um, just on that way we're here. And they're little cabins. And you can come and spend that. If you want to do a retreat alone, is what I'm saying. And as long as the novitiate's running, we usually have mass every day. And um, there's a bed in all of this. Uh, you can schedule, the, the, you can see they're pretty booked now, but as you move out in the months ahead, there's four of them. So here, number one is available and so forth. You can kind of see. Then you just email Annette, just hit reservation as an email. She'll put you on the schedule. It's a donation. We know that colleges, college students don't have the money. We recommend 50 for the first night, 40 for the next. Uh, give me 10, 20, whatever you got. Don't worry. God's taking good care of us. But, you know. So I wanted just to make that available to you. Um, and feel free to, to come. Uh, that's that's the, the layout of the camp and where the hermitages are. So that's all at desales.org. Great place just to do a private retreat. Okay. If you have two of them, you could do a retreat with somebody else. So you just each of you take a hermitage. You can put two people in them, but for quiet, you might just want to be alone. Okay, so yeah, just sell stuff. I, I'd love to show you camp too. So if you do come, make uh, through Joy or whatever, just put in there somehow or let Annette know when you reserve. Like, you know, you want to just identify yourself so that I can, I'll show you around camp. And, you know, that type of thing. And then Caloric in the cabin, that you uh, oh, yes. would employ. Oh, this is the group. Yeah, this is the group. So we're building a new cabin. I don't know if I have a picture of that. It'll take too long to find. We're building a new cabin and it's for Catholic Youth Camp, which is kind of life team camp. It's not under them, but it's like it, or Damascus, if you're familiar with those, or Steubenville. And we have, we started last summer, but we need a new cabin. We're, we sold out in six hours, 165 spots for this summer. So it's high school kids. And so we're building the beds and the lofts for the new cabin. And um, we're gonna, Joey and I will work out a time but uh, I want to get the, the workshop all set up so we have all the wood and all that. And basically, it's drilling, uh, cutting uh, two by fours and drilling and getting the OSB onto the boards. You know, I, I, I can you know explain it all. It's not hard. And uh, we get these lofts built. That would be a big help. And maybe even the beds too. So that's a project coming up. And if you could help with that, it's really a good cause. The camp was powerful last summer. We had a couple of miracles. God was just so present. Yeah, the kids were, the kids just, everybody loved it. I'm so used to, on the last day of camp, the staff takes off. I have to pay them at the end so they stay, you know, because otherwise they take off on me. So I give everybody the check. They stayed 24 more hours. I'm still cooking the next day. I'm going, would you guys go home? It's, it's over. But I didn't want them to leave either. That's how powerful it is. It's just a wonderful summer. Okay? Please visit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm also recording. I'll finish recording this. But, yeah, I don't know if we have any...